Let's talk about machine learning. This video is sponsored by Springboard, but more on that later. Yes, computers can learn, and in many cases they can do it better than humans. Now, I'm not talking about Terminator-style artificial general intelligence, or HAL from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Be careful, child. I can see your lips move. I'm talking about what is known as machine learning that branch of artificial intelligence that allows computer systems to learn specific tasks from data. It's what's used when your photo is automatically tagged by Facebook or the voice recognition system in your Alexa speaker. And it's being increasingly put to use in many different sectors. But how does it work? Why has there been such a sudden explosion in the last five years? And how can you learn it? Traditional approaches to programming rely on a set of rules. They're laid down by the programmer and they can't be changed. On the other hand, machine learning systems are set a task and they're given a large amount of data to learn from to find the best way of completing that task. Now, they don't just work out of the box. The machine learning engineer has to do a few little tasks to get it working properly. They have to prepare the data, decide which parts of the data are likely to give the best learning outcomes. That's something called feature engineering, and it's really important. And then they have to decide which model is likely to give the best results and then optimize that model. But once all of those jobs are done, you have a system that can learn. And it can be so good that it really can outperform humans at certain specific tasks, like in 2016 when Google DeepMind's AlphaGo beat the world champion Go player Lee Sedol. Now, that was a task that only a few years earlier was considered impossible for a machine to be able to do well at because of the complexity of the game. There's also the DeepMind system for diagnosing eye disease, which performs better than most doctors in coming to a correct diagnosis. Now, notice that these are small, specific, targeted tasks. What machines have trouble doing is transferring that, that learning, what they learned in that, to a different domain. Humans are still much better at that. The increasing rate of developments like these are due in part to our ability to collect, store, and access data. Around 90% of the world's data has been collected in the last two years. Advances in and access to computing power have also been very useful in the rollout of machine learning. In the 1970s, a typical CPU clock speed was measured in kilohertz. Today, it's measured in gigahertz. That's billions of cycles per second. But in spite of all these recent advances, machine learning wouldn't be possible if it weren't for centuries-old maths and pioneers who were pushing this field over 60 years ago. Let's talk about today's sponsor, Springboard. Now, you know, I'm always saying on this channel that the best way to learn the subjects that we cover is by doing projects. But one of the problems for beginners is that it's not always obvious what projects you should be doing. And that's where I think the Springboard Machine Learning Engineer track might be able to help you. If you want to learn how to write machine learning algorithms or want hands-on experience deploying a machine learning model into production, or you want to learn how to build and deploy a deep learning prototype, then this could be a great option for you. You'll also get a one-to-one -one mentor to support your learning. If you apply through this channel, you could get a $500 scholarship. There are only 20 available and they're awarded on a first come, first serve basis. Check if you qualify by applying. The application is free and takes 10 minutes. Use the code AI Springboard. An unlikely hero in this machine learning story is an 18th century Presbyterian minister who, when he wasn't working on his religious duties, developed the theory that now bears his name, Thomas Bayes. He deserves a video to himself. And then of course there's Alan Turing who in 1950 posed the question, can machines think? Well, can they? The field was pushed further in 1952 by the AI pioneer Arthur Samuel. He was working for IBM and he created the first learning machine. In fact, he was the first person to really popularize the term machine learning. And his system could learn to play checkers or drafts if you're in the UK. At this point in the 1950s, there was real momentum behind the research that was going on into artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think amongst the researchers, they felt that, you know, having systems that could learn wasn't that far away. And this was helped in 1957 by Frank Rosenblatt's creation of the perceptron, 
which was an early form of a neural network. But unfortunately, that early optimism gradually faded away and not much happened in the 70s. In fact, there was a lot of disappointment and disenchantment around the perception that AI and machine learning had failed to make much progress. In 1973, the UK Science Research Council commissioned a report. That report, called the Lighthill Report, noted that in no part of the field have the discoveries made so far produced the major impact that was then promised. I mean, that's quite a damning summary of the work that had gone on. And that perception led to a, a lack of confidence in the sector, a lack of interest in the sector, and, and ultimately, a lack of research funds going into the sector. It created something called the AI winter. Now, some research did continue and large companies were using AI type systems called expert systems, but these were really just a set of rules. They were decision making systems that tried to copy the way a human expert might make a decision, but they didn't learn from data. They weren't proper AI. And the field continued to disappoint well into the 1990s. The Japanese fifth generation project, which set out in 1981 with some really ambitious goals. Um, they wanted to create a system that could carry out a conversation, that could translate languages, that could interpret images and reason like a human being. That completely failed to deliver. And by this point, the term AI, artificial intelligence, had some quite negative connotations. In fact, so much so that companies that were involved in the field removed AI from you know, the names of the products that they were creating because it was putting investors off. There was one bright light. In 1997, IBM's Deep Blue defeated the chess champion, the world chess champion, Garry Kasparov. Now, this was bad news for Kasparov, but it was good news for IBM. And it definitely helped with the PR of the sector. Now, this wasn't strictly AI. It wasn't learning from data. It was using a brute force approach but it was a brute force approach that worked and that demonstrably worked because it beat the best chess player in the world. It was able to process 200 million moves a second and from those determine which was the best move to make. And it beat the world champion, but progress was still incredibly slow. And then this man came along, Jeffrey Hinton. Now I say he came along, he'd been working in the field for years and he'd been working on neural networks. Now this was a, an area of research that had been abandoned by most AI researchers, by most machine learning researchers. And in fact, he was shunned by some people in the industry and ridiculed for continuing to work in this field. But in 2006, he published a seminal paper showing how to train a deep neural network capable of recognizing handwritten digits with an accuracy greater than 98%. That's when the machine learning explosion started and it's been gathering pace ever since. From recommending which films you might want to watch to which products you might want to buy, detecting fraud in your bank account or spam in your email or deciding whether or not a bank should lend you any money, Machine learning is present in many parts of our lives, whether we know it or not. There are different types of machine learning. There's supervised learning, where you give the system what's called labeled data. This is data usually that a human's been through and given a particular label, the system can learn from that and then it can find the patterns that it's learned in the labeled data in new unseen unlabeled data. So for example, you could give it 10,000 x-ray images that a radiologist has been through and marked as having a tumor. It can learn from those images and then you can give it an unseen image and it will determine whether or not that image contains a tumor. There's unsupervised learning where you just give it a whole load of data and it finds patterns within that data. So you might give it thousands of customer details and their buying history, and it would show clusters of similar customers. Then there's reinforcement learning. Now that's where the system is trying to determine the best policy to achieve a particular goal, and you use rewards and penalties to do that. It's often used in robotics, uh, so the robot can learn from its environment, much the same way that humans do. In all of these situations, the computer is using an algorithm to process and learn from data. As you might guess, there are quite a few different algorithms, but a few of the common ones are linear regression, logistic regression, 
K nearest neighbors, support vector machines, decision trees, and of course, neural networks. Now, if you want to learn machine learning, you're going to need to know maths, particularly linear algebra and statistics. You're going to have to be able to code, and I would recommend that you learn Python. And like anything in life, if you want to become good at it, you just have to practice. Practice as much as you can.